As part of Green F's coverage of the unfolding situation in Sudan, we are sharing, with permission, this discussion between three Sudanese Australian women about the situation on the ground, the background to the conflict, and a few things the Australian government can do right now to support the people of Sudan. So, hello everybody. My name is uh, Maysoon. I'm a Sudanese Australian. I live in Sydney, and um, I'm not. I, and it's very important for me to um, just clarify that I'm not an active member in, in, in any community and group. So what I say here, uh, I represent myself. I do not represent uh, um, uh, any organized group. But I, I, I hope that I'm ex expressing the feelings of of um, of people in my community. And I have with me today two dear friends, uh, Sarah from Melbourne and Suzanne from uh, Canberra. And we want to give you an update about uh, what's going on in Sudan. So I'll let uh, both of you girls to introduce yourselves, if I can start with Sarah. Salam, Maysoon. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I'm on, the Wurundjeri land of the Kulu Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name is Sarah Sinada. I'm a Sudanese Australian uh, living in Melbourne. Um, I'm a member of the Sudanese community um, and I work in the field of humanitarian assistance. Over to you, Suzanne. Uh, hi, my name is Suzanne. I'm joining from Canberra, the Nanawal country. Thank you, Suzanne. And I also have to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land. I'm on direct land. Um, so I want to start with an update with you. Um, I love the slogan from the revolution. Uh, it comes from the women's movement that the personal is public and the public is personal. So let's start with updates that's happening within your own family. How's the situation with your families in Sudan? Where are they now? And what are their options? What's going on? Whoever wants to start. I'm happy to start this soon. Um, yep. Since the since the fighting started on Saturday, um, my family has been caught in the crossfire between uh, both armed forces. Um, they have been, um, you know, homebound on the floor, trying to um, just avoid any stray bullet or airstrike as much as possible by keeping the lights off. Um, access to electricity has been a challenge. Access to uh, clean water has been a challenge. Um, my uncle was, um, you know, homebound, unable to leave his house because his area was very heavily, uh, there was heavy fighting in the area where he lives. Um, he was in his home alone for five days without electricity or water until he uh, finally decided to take the risk and uh, go to his friend's house. As we speak, my brother and his little family are also in the process of fleeing Khartoum. Um, my grandmother and my aunts and cousins are also stuck at home in Bahri, which is an area where there's a lot of fighting. Um, friends, some have left, some are also stuck at home. It's, um, it's a challenging situation to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Suzanne? Uh, okay, um, my family, I live in Australia, my family, all my family members are back home in Sudan and they live in the Sahafa. A Sahafa is very heavy, there is very heavy fights in, in the Sahafa. So I, every day, there is, I've, I'm full of lots of emotions. I'm worried, I'm stressed, I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm in tears because at many points, I've I, I tried to ring, no answers, no internet. They caught there and unable to leave home. My sister has little children that are crying all the time, very fearful of what's happening. So they are caught there. They, they don't know where to go because you're risking your life if you go outside. You don't know where to go. Everywhere is unsafe. So I'm struggling to get hold of, 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 of them, which cause lots of stress, which is causing me lots of stress. I don't know, I feel helpless and I don't know what to do. I just hope everyone is safe in Sudan. That's what I hope for. But I think it's everyone's dilemma. Everyone's dilemma nowadays, yeah. 
Absolutely. It's Everybody higher has... difficulties of contacting your family. It's just you live in constant fear. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all share stories about, you know, not sleeping like three days straight, you know, mm. Mm. it's impossible to sleep, <laughs> you know, just. Um, yeah. 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 So for me, um, I have my elderly um, parents. Um, they were in, in Khartoum, where the fighting is, and um, but luckily they they managed to um, evacuate to Sinja, my hometown, which is a five hour drive from Khartoum, pretty far away from the fighting. I still have my brother there, um, and I have my sister in Bahri, which in an area which was heavily hit yesterday. But uh, thankfully, um, she's you know currently safe. She has her um, two teenage kids, and but she has been you know, she went out for in, in aid for uh, you know to visit um, her you know her parents in law, and she talked about you know seeing bodies all across the street, you know dead soldiers, and it's uh, you know horrific. And, and and I just wanted to point out that this is especially for anybody who's watching who has like Sudanese friends or Sudanese co-workers. It's, um, we've just been talking about how stressful and traumatic this experience is. And, and we're all sharing stories, not here in Australia, but all over the world of being um, like this kind of, um, you know, psychological thing where you, you feel that you're in Sudan. I keep saying like, I just was supposed to pick up some groceries today. And I was saying, oh, is it safe for me to go out? And it took me a while to realize that I'm not in Khartoum, I'm actually in Sydney. Or just he if you hear a bang, you feel like, oh, you need to hide somewhere. And, and I'm sure you have uh, um, Absolutely. Yeah, similar stories like this. Have you had something like this, Absolutely. Suzanne? Absolutely. I Once I was on my backyard, just sitting there, and all of a sudden there was a, a horn, like a car horn. And mm -hmm. I just jumped. I felt like I'm in Sudan. And then I started to imagine how people are feeling there. It's just beyond your imagination. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I've been feeling the same way. Like I, I was looking at an email from uh, from my children's school saying that they've got to do some renovations starting, I don't know, sometime soon. And I was like, is it safe to do so? Like the that's the first thing that came to my mind. I was like, can they actually do it? Is it safe? And then I realized that we're not in Sudan. Yes, yeah, and that was the first thought that came to my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, is it safe? How can they do that? <laughs> and it's, it's just amazing that all of these stories like are shared by everybody I know, like in London, in, in the States. I mean, it's just this feeling is like everywhere. Yeah, oh, yeah, I thought it was just me. This is the first time that I hear someone else also talking about this. I thought it was just me. I thought I was going crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, no. We can't disconnect. It's really hard to disconnect. Yeah, yeah. Very hard. So, I mean, like we've explained, like we're not like, you know, political analysts or experts. So we're sharing what what information we know. And um, so we know that there is a growing number of deaths. Um, so I just want to describe the situation. So there's a growing number of deaths. A lot of people are trying to evacuate, but they are homebound. Um, casualties with a lot of hospitals you know, out of work because of either they've been targeted directly and bombed and they're unsafe or they have been forced to evacuate uh, by both parties. So this is, we're talking about the army and the uh, rapid, um, what do you call it? The rapid support forces, um, the kind of official militia that was created by the mm -hmm. army. And, um, and, and, and also hospitals lack, you know, medicine, um, medical staff saying they are over exhausted um, from working um, nonstop. Um, so this is what I know. If anybody can add anything, what do you know about the situation in Sudan? There is huge shortage of medical supplies. Yeah. yeah. People don't have access to emergency medical care, as we all know. Yeah. There is shortages of food and basic needs like water clean water yeah. there is no internet if you are abroad you can't call your family you can't get yeah you can't, you can't there is no internet no electricity yeah yeah so people can't charge their phones yeah yeah no they cannot charge their phone they cannot yeah it's just a complete nightmare yeah yeah we don't... i think go ahead Sarah. i think especially yes i think especially the medical sector is 
it's is 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 really hitting cri- a crisis that's that we've never seen or witnessed before, and it's worse than anything right now. Like, yes, there's shortage in food, there's shortage in water, but people manage, you know, somehow to get up the bare minimum that would keep them alive. But when it comes to medical supplies being so low, and when it comes to shortage in, you know, medical doctors, I've been reading stuff about medical students that are actually going to help at hospitals and, and you know, treating people, medical students who have not completed their training yet. Uh, people who need to get the, who get regular dial- dialysis, people with kidney failure, people who um, need a, a cancer treatments, they're unable to access any of these things. People who have uh, children who are, who have epilepsy and who require very important medications to keep them going. Yeah. And none of this can be found. And that's, that's really drastic. This, I mean, a lot of people are actually losing their lives because of the lack of medical supplies. So I think that's the, I, I, w- I would classify it as the number one humanitarian need right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the situation was already like bad even before, uh, you know, the current events. And, and like the, 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 the medical, like the, the health system was already, you know, in shambles. And then this, you know, war starts and it just like, you know, obliterates whatever there is left. Um, yeah, and then of course, like there's destruction, you know, everywhere of, you know, like major, you know, institutions, whether we're talking about hospitals or the airport and, you know, other stuff. And, um, but, you know, like what you mentioned, like people people are getting by. And this is the other part that I want to talk about is the amazing organization and grassroots movement. Um, that's going on in the ground and 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 this is like I feel the legacy of the revolution when we when it started it's that this networking that happened with the people in the ground and it just grew and it developed through the years uh, whether people used it at first to address you know um, economic situations shortages in general that's before the war and um, usually, and we've had a lot of hits. First, we had the, dis, you know, the dispersal of the, um, um, what do you would, of the sit-in, which was disastrous. And people took time to get collected and come back. And then when the coup happened as well, people took time to come back. But when this war happened, straight away, like the response was very quick. People were, you know, um, uh, like there's, uh, you know, covering shortages, medicines that, you know, you can share this. Like, so there's there's this network that's trying to cover needs everywhere, whether it's if helping with evacuating people, responding to emergency need, health emergencies, responding to people who are under siege, who need food, who need water. Mm-hmm. And, and we're seeing people now helping to bury some of the bodies that are just left on the streets and the situation is getting worse and, and and many other things and and I'm sure you have sp- like stories that you've seen in the media of you or you've been told by your friends or family so anybody want to talk about the organization on the ground now uh, this is my favorite part <laughs> talking about what's yeah happening on the ground so in the middle of all these dis- destructions and death and blood you you, you see these local people on the ground, providing grassroots support to each other. You hear a story about uh, about people telling each other about which safest route to take, which safe, which street to avoid, and where to find clean water, where to find medical supplies, where to find food supplies, as you were saying. Mm-hmm. And also these sh- people having these short videos on how to perform um, first aid, on how to treat an injured pe- person. It's it's amazing. It's astonishing, and also these video uh, tips on 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 how to calm a terrified child. This all happening while in the midst of all these destructions and 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 killing and and blood, and 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 also women women um, donating uh, sanitary products to each other. This is this is amazing. This is this is local community supporting each other. This is giving hope to each other. This is caring about each other. These are the local heroes to me. To me, these are the local heroes. Yeah. Amazing. Completely agree. Completely agree, Suzanne. That's the ray of hope that we have. Um, 
it's it's been incredibly inspiring to see how you you see a lot of volunteers individuals as well as organized um organized work we've seen there's the neighborhood committees or the resistance committees yeah. that have immediately taken up assumed the role of providing you know access to life saving um assistance so houses that have run out of food you find the neighborhood committees coming together and bringing food or um houses that have absolutely no drinking water they would bring them some drinking water uh houses where you know a woman is giving birth and you know they can't get to a hospital they manage to bring in a midwife and also you see a lot of volunteers as you mentioned may soon going and 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 you know taking out bodies from the streets because they're you know it's and burying them and um we've also seen that Sudanese people abroad in the diaspora taking very organized and very solid steps by providing immediate assistance bringing electronic money to people in Sudan to be able to buy electricity for those who are uh, completely out of power we've seen the Sudanese doctors union doing absolutely incredible work in terms of fundraising and also keeping the data as accurate as possible in terms of the deaths and injuries of course it's impossible to account for all of them when people are not even able to go down the streets but you know at least we have some numbers and that's that's thanks to um the Sudanese doctors union so um it's it is incredibly inspiring we've we've got really organized groups with a very strong mission everyone has assumed a role and if if it's not your immediate help helping your immediate family you're helping others as well so there's always there's always support taking place but the the size of the crisis is above and beyond all this yeah. there's still more that needs to be done Mm. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And to me, these are the people who deserve to live. They deserve to live. They deserve to govern. They de deserve to lead future Sudan. Yeah, because yeah. they do care about people. Yeah, and 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 nobody else did. I mean, the war started. No. Nobody even came out to talk to the people. Not even the, not the of course not the army, not the RSF. Nobody like addressed the people in any way. And unfortunately, not even the political parties. So yeah. nobody came out to address the people's needs and you know talk to them and yeah and 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 and, and I think somebody who's been following like grass movements uh, the grassroots movements just the examples that you that you mentioned you know whether it's sanitary pads for for women or you know mental health or support for people with disabilities so that we have parents and families who are sharing medicines like I have an extra medicine for your child if you want you yes. can pick it up from here and and these things that before was not a priority like people thought was not a priority and and we found like we've seen women movements people with disability movements you know advocating and saying no this is a priority and now when with this crisis happened when this crisis happened like straight away these were the first things that were addressed and nobody said oh it's not a priority anymore so so this there's this like raised level of awareness of how people's needs are different and how what a priority is and all of these are are, are priorities and 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 i think that's like 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 um like a credit to the grassroots movements i don't want to take a long time so uh, just so we can like let's give a big quick background so who's fighting who and um are there like any internal and external factors that are making this worse and as i said we're not political analysts we're just saying what we know so who'd like to go first on this that or suzanne i'm, I'm happy to to, to start yeah. so I'm, I'm yeah as you said this is my personal views on on what's happening in the on in sudan so for me, like many other Sudanese, I see this war as a war between two generals. Mm -hmm. This war is a war between two generals. Hemeti, the leader of the militia, rabbit support force, Janjaweed, and Burhan, the head of the Sudan armed force. Both men have history of violence. Both men have history of human rights allegation, allegations of human rights violations. So these two men are fighting for power fighting for status, fighting for control. Yeah. So this this war has nothing to do with people. People are caught in between, people are paying the price of it, but these 
war is war for war of war between these two generals, and it's just for power, nothing else, nothing else. And they these two generals have turned Khartoum into a war zone now. Yeah, and and I really hate it. Like when the media says like this is a civil war, it's it's not a civil war, it's a war between uh -huh. factions. You uh -huh. know. This is like if Wagner Group decided to clash with the Russian army. Nobody would call it a a a, 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 a civil war. Or if like the Blackwater Security Company clashed with the American army. Nobody would call that a civil war. These are two uh, fra fractions in power. Entity. Yes. Armed soldiers. It's not, it doesn't even raise, it doesn't even rise to that level. It doesn't even rise to that level, Mason. It's, it, Al Burhan said it on the news when he was being interviewed he said our problem is not with the rapid support forces our problem is with general daglo and his brother mm -hmm. so a, a, a man having a problem with two other men or a warmonger having a problem with two other warmongers yeah. means that the entire nation lives in fear that the infra infrastructure is completely destroyed and sabotaged that people's lives are worth nothing just because mm -hmm. A, a, f a few people have a problem with each other. And the problem has to do with controlling power and controlling the resources of Sudan. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's infuriating beyond words. Beyond words. Yeah. So um, just to give like a quick analysis of what people are saying. So we have the rapid uh, support force, uh, the support forces and the army. The rapid is a militia that's been created by al-Bashir during his time to support him in the war in Darfur. And it's a part of the, somehow it's a part of the army. So it's a militia that's part of the army. And like you said, up to now when Burhan speaks, General Burhan speaks in the news, he still talk, talks about the rapid forces as being a part of the army. And um, we have to remember that. Uh, and and so and so the clash happened. People assume that, the, that members of the previous regime, the Islamists have instigated this war and, and pushed it forward because somehow they want to come back in power or they were afraid of the, um, the, the the political agreement that was about to be signed and this is, was a way out. We were not clear on that. Um, I, I just want to like cover a few things. So another thing we have to like, just to, um, you know, highlight is that this is the rapid support forces that has been uh, participating in the Yemen war yeah, has been um, sponsored by the Saudi regime to fight in the Yemen war. Um, this is also uh, the, the the forces that somehow have been implicated with this, keeping the borders safe, um, uh, uh, like blocking immigrants from migrating to Europe, and has been, let's say, has dealings with the European Union. So this is a militia that has been sanctioned and legitimized, not by the Sudanese people, but by the regime in Sudan and also by the blessings of the international community. And as I said, this is this is my this is my analysis. And um, yeah, any other factors that so and, and there's a lot of factors. Throw in the UAE. People are talking about their implications. Libya. Um, who else? Egypt, who's supporting General Burhan and do not are not interested in a democratic um, any kind of democratic transition in Sudan. Oh, a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. 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 And as you can see, all these entities and international communities and international regimes, regional and, and internationals, they all they all supporting these two, two generals, and they all anti-revolutionary bodies. Or most of them are anti-revolutionary bodies. So there is no wonder they want to support uh, Military against its own citizens. They want to support militia when it's 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 good for them to do so. Yeah, and because we have like four minutes left, I want to like wrap up quickly by. Um, so, what? How do we? Just one point though on that, um, yeah. Mason. Before we move on, you see all this interference and all these countries with uh, that are knee deep in uh, interference with what's going on and allowing for it to happen. All the, there's absolutely no pressure being applied on Hemeti or on Burhan to actually stop this. It's all just talk, talk, talk. When, but when it comes to 
the situation becoming of uh, of of this epic proportions of uh, disaster no one is opening doors for uh humanitarian entrance into their countries sudan has got borders with seven other countries not a single one said we welcome refugees yeah. to get to for sudanese people who are fleeing this war and trying to go through the borders with egypt who has been the one of the biggest players and one of the biggest supporters of the war monger al burhan to go, be able to go into egypt you've got to have a visa same with all the other countries that are around people are just making their way through some some are able to make their way through others are stuck in the borders yeah. so it's it's just um ridiculous yeah and people who are fleeing Khartoum, it's not just that it's hard to 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 seek refuge in 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 the surrounding or neighboring countries. Even inside Sudan, it's it's a hell of a journey to leave your home to ha to to, fo to be forced to flee your home in Khartoum and to seek refuge in a like a neighboring village or towns. That's if you make it. So yeah. it's not it's it's absolutely not safe. Yeah, for for them. So. I'm I'm gonna give a minute just for this ends. Minute each for all of you because this like I, I can see Zoom telling me like I have two minutes left. And yeah. I know we have like several demands that we want from the from our Australian government, and that's to extend the visa of Sudanese here who are on visiting visas, to extend their stay here because there's no way for them to go back. Also open the way for like um you know like humanitarian visas for Sudanese who are able to flee the war. And to pay attention, we want updates on what's happening for the Australian Sudanese who are in, in Sudan right now. And I'm going to give like less than a minute each for each of you. If there's anything you want to add before we end. And we're going to join you every week with an update. Go ahead, Sarah. So, yes, please. Um, I think, first of all, we need to we need the Australian government to act on evacuating Sudanese people who are stuck in Australia. Now, this is of the utmost importance and urgency. At this point, most countries have started doing their evacuations. The U.S., France, um, most diplom all diplomats have actually been out of the country. And it's expected that once evacuations are complete, the fighting will probably intensify. So mm -hmm. A, get the Sudanese Australians out or any Australians in Sudan out. Uh, the second would be for the, or not the second, of equal importance is that the Australian government applies all possible pressures on the fighting warmongers to cease for a ceasefire, even if just for a few hours each day so that people can manage to get food, can manage to get water, um, can get to hospitals if needed, and opening humanitarian corridors. Now, that's also of utmost important to get, importance to get the humanitarian assistance. Now, if we have humanitarian corridors, even if just for a few hours per day, we're able to get life-saving support to people, medical supplies to hospitals. Yeah. And last but not least, it's important, it's also of extreme, extreme importance to get medicine into Sudan. Any plane flying to Sudan, any ship going to do an evacuation needs to take medicines. There's lack of basic things from Panadol and Band-Aids all the way to cancer treatments. Yeah. Anything would help at this point. So that's, that's also extremely important. 